the one we just did? No, for the Paul. Oh, oh, got it, got yeah, it, got it, got it, got, got, use, got it, got it. Yeah. Use, you know, okay, things. that's what I thought. That's so weird. It's so weird. So, um, like I say, I think it's because they're still baby. Hello. Hi. Oh, How? Oh wait, do you have? I can hear myself. Do you have headphones in? I do. Oh. Is your output going through the headphones? I believe so. Um, hmm. How do I check do you, that? I don't know this application. You, yeah, do you have a gear, <clears throat> gear icon in the lower left-hand corner of your mm-hmm. screen? Just to see if it says that your... Um... It won't oh, let actually, me change it. Sorry, take that back. It's your computer. You have to go to your computer settings and make sure your uh, sound output okay. shows headphones. Mm-hmm. Did it give hmm. you the option the when you when signed, you signed on, on to, to say it, you it, had headphones, had headphones on? on? Right now I put default headphones, but I realize I'm looking at it now, it says microphone, external microphone built in, So I, but it won't let me change it, so maybe I have to go out of the session to go back in. Well, what about what just about on your computer? computer? <clears throat> I'm looking for that setting and I'm not sound, let's see. Are you on a Mac? Are you on a Mac? Yes. Just one second. Okay. Headphones. Input. It's not letting me switch it to... Okay. Maybe, okay. yeah, leave, leave yeah. and then and see then if you can fix it and come back. Fix it and come back. Great. Cool. Thank you. All right. Just one second. Oh, it's not letting me leave the session. Oh, wow. Oh, you're, wow. You're, stuck. You're, you're stuck. Actually, it's Actually, not letting, it's me, not letting leave me leave, leave the, the session either. either. Gina, do you have Gina, some you kind of maybe power? power? I don't. Let me see your back. Make sure that I'm not losing, losing it. And you survived and you went, you did a lot of things. I, I mean, first, we're going to get to it all, but can I just say... Um, and I can because this is this is this is the platform to say it. I love that you were on two soap operas, and more, maybe more maybe more than two. Were you on more than two or just? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, because but, yeah, go ahead. No, most recently just two, but yes. Okay, so here's the thing about that is that um, I don't care. We went to theater school, and I know a lot of people think that that is. Uh, or some people talk shit about uh, soap operas in terms of yeah. acting. I yeah. have never seen or heard actors work as hard as my friends that have been on soap operas. And in terms of the pace and the pacing and the um, the amount of work that is required of 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 actors on soap operas, is stunning. So I just love it because I think that it is like from what my, what I know about it, it's like a gymnastics routine that people are doing on those sets. So we'll go, I just want to say that I like give full props to that because it's not a joke. Soap opera work. It is not Thank a joke. You. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate so, that. Shout out. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. So I'll just ask then pursuant to that because I think you are the first person we're interviewing who was on a soap opera and I would love to know everything about the process of your audition and how you because I, I, I used to I used to when I was in high school my show was days and I read soap opera digest and everything but I would love to know like I've heard some people describe it as more of a it ha, can sometimes have a feeling of more of a regular job since it's like daytime hours etc but I would love to hear what your experience of just the work of being on a soap opera well, uh, first of all, I love everyone that I work with. I'm, I'm on days, so... Um, oh, you're really, still on it! Oh, I'm my still gosh. On it. I'm still on it. <laughs> so, in fact, I'm, like, shooting six episodes <gasps> next week. So, I'm oh on a little my. break in Canada. <laughs> Just, like, here having a little vacation before we go into Good all for that. you. Oh, my gosh. Thank six you. in a week. It's like Saturday Night Live. What's happening? Okay. How did you yeah. get on these? What was your first one that you were on, first of the all? First, was it... The first one I was on was, I think, Days. And then when I first came to L.A., and then I did General Hospital, and then I did Young and the Restless, and then I did, then I was on Bold and the Beautiful and Days at the same time during what? the pandemic. And then now I'm on days, so we're doing days. Yeah. Oh my, oh, Tina, oh, Tina, no. bow down. 
Tina, this is this is this is incredible because what this tells me is that you are extremely obviously talented, but we know that because I've seen you on Rizzoli and I all the things. But it's also you are um um it must be really wonderful to work with because people keep bringing you back and back and back. So you must be like a real sort of team player, which I bet is part of your theater train. Like you are an yes. ensemble, right? Yes. I think the best part about doing any of this is the collaboration part. You know, when people don't want, it's funny when people don't like notes and don't like getting notes. I'm always like, I love notes. Like I can't just do this on my own and act in a bag. Like I need, I need you to like, tell me what's going on. What do you see that I don't see? You know, all of that is, that's the best part, the collaboration. Yeah. So I'm still eager to know a little bit more yeah. about like the, how you how it started with your audition oh. and how you experienced the day to day work of being a soap opera actor as opposed sure. to any other type of actor. Sure. Um, well, I I got the audition to to go in for days, and I read for Marnie Setia, who I'm hope I'm saying her name right, um, who's the casting director, and it went well. She said, you know, we have a call back, and I said, great. Uh, I can't remember if that was the next day or if that was the same day. It may have been the same day she told wow. me to wait. I can't remember because the producers were upstairs and they wanted to do producer sessions right away. And, or I, it may have been the next day. And she, they sent sides, you know, again, but I just assumed they were the same audition. And it was like 14 pages. It was like a <gasps> lot of pages. But just so you know, so scripts are, you know, one and a half spacing. So oh, it's not yeah. single spacing. But, but still, still oh my, listen, I, I'm like an under 10. I like always do an under 10 because that's my jam. I have trouble with that. I don't, oh my, you must be, you're, okay, so you get all these pages and you assumed it was the same, but I'm guessing it wasn't the same. So I show up and she wanted to just read all of us ladies that came back in to, to, for the producer session and just like talk to us and all that kind of stuff. And she said, so you got the new scenes? And I said, uh, n new scenes? Uh, n no. And then she said, oh, well, we got to go. We got to go up to the producers right now. So we all walked up and she goes, don't worry, I'll put you last. You know, you don't here's the new scripts. She sent me. Oh, my God. I'm and peeing my pants right yeah. here. <laughs> and oh I don't God. remember how different it was, but I, I think it was quite different. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and um, she said, just take, you know, whatever time we'll put you last. And there was like maybe four, four women that was oh, my nose is running. But um, okay. four women ahead of me, and uh, I just studied my oh butt off. Oh, my God. You, know, you were like, okay, NYU, okay, um, tons of Shakespeare memorization. Don't right. fail me now. So, okay, right. so you go, were you Which nervous? Which gets harder when you get older. <laughs> No shit. Okay, right. so you go in the room and there's producers there. Obviously, it's a producer session. And is the casting lady still in the room with you? She, she's still in the room. And it was only Great. one producer, the executive producer. Okay. So Great. It just in, but it was a big conference room. Anyway, <gasps> when I was waiting to go in, one of the actresses, like, I guess they overheard what had happened. And this, this another actor said, uh, you didn't get the sides. And I said, no, you didn't get the new scenes. I said, no. And she said, that sucks. That's terrible. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to uh, study. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. Study. Like, be quiet. I mean, like, leave me right. alone. Right. I mean, not helpful. Is, not helpful. Not helpful. Not helpful. I'm not that person. I don't compete with anybody in the audition room. I compete with myself. And I think maybe that's part of my success. I just, I'm hard enough on myself. I don't need to add like everyone else as a distraction. But it was really interesting. Um, so, oh, did I lose you guys? No, oh, oh. we just figured out that when we're not talking, it's better if we might mute ourselves because we have yeah, that's ambient it. Noise Copy that all. ambient okay. noises. So, so then um, he, he they called me in, and it went really well. I mean, it was just this huge conference room with a giant table in between us. So it was like not like a theater setup um, or an audition room, a normal audition room. And it went really well. I mean, I think I sobbed. I think I was shaking. I think like all of those things. And maybe it was from the, that cold read sort of nerves that just let sure. me just go with my just go with my intuition, you know? Yeah, right. So. No time to think and obsess and, and worry about it. Yeah. Right. Do you get to like considering how much dialogue you have to memorize every single day for the next day's work? Um, is there any room for improvisation or do you, are you supposed to say it word for word? supposed to say it word for word. I think there's a little bit of leeway, you know, the longer you've been on the show, they, they don't, 
you can't improv for sure. It's all written. But, you know, if you get a the instead of and or, you know, those little things, the pace is so quick that they're not going to redo the take. And we usually get one to two takes, right? We don't get multiple takes. Oh, my so, God. Um, it moves at an incredible speed. So when you said what you said about soap acting and soap actors, I really have a tremendous respect. Uh, I think a lot of people like to put judgment on high art and low art. And I, I don't really get the point of that. <laughs> but uh, but they, it, it, people love it. People watch it. It gives them a sense of comfort. And the actors that I've met are so hardworking and so talented, like very good actors. Um, they're just in the job that they're in. You know what I mean? And a lot of it's, of a lot of this soap acting, has, soap work has gotten better. So. Absolutely. I would go so far as to say that's probably a sexist thing that soap, uh, um, soap operas have the whatever re reputation that they do um, because, you know, anything that a lot of women like, people tend to denigrate. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. So did you always want to be an actor? Did you always want to go to theater school? What was your journey when you were picking colleges? Wow. Um... You know, I, being an Asian American woman, I didn't really see that it would be a possible career path for me. Um, I was like a secret artist, you know, like inside I really wanted to be on the stage and I really wanted to act and all of that. But I didn't have examples, really. I think growing up I had like for a short stint, Margaret Cho and, and Lucy Liu and, you know, very few. And then like Chinese actresses that I knew of. Um, but... It was a tough journey. So I secretly auditioned for LaGuardia Music and Art and Performing Arts in New York City, you know, the Fame High School. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know that you went there, and I'm wondering, like, you see, what does it mean to secretly audition where you didn't tell your folks and you were like, didn't I'm tell out? My folks. Yeah, I mean, how old are you when you start high school? I mean, I was probably. Oh, yeah. What are we, 12? No, 13? Yeah, 13. No, 13. Really young. Really yeah, young. really young. On your own. So I, you know, I grew up in New York City, so I took the subway up, I, I applied to audition, and well, first I was in the, the fine arts program, so which they also didn't like, and I had a, an amazing art teacher in junior high school who mentored me to make, make a portfolio and all this kind of stuff, so I had gone up and did the art test without telling my parents, and I, and I got into the art program. And then, wait, but I so you didn't wait. You didn't get into that. You went for fine art for for, and you. What do you mean the art test? What the hell is that? <laughs> that sounds horrifying. What do you mean an art test? So, <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't audition yet for theater because I think it was too scary at that moment for me. So first, I did the art program because I was encouraged by a grown-up teacher who was like, thought she saw a talent in me, which was very amazing to have a teacher like that, um, and. Uh, the art test was you had to have a full portfolio, like at least 10 or 15 pieces in a portfolio. So you carry that big old thing. Like imagine a 12 year old kid carrying a portfolio uptown. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy when I think about it. Um, and then you get there and there's like um, a still life set up and there's all the, everybody sits around on desks and you have to draw, you have to draw the still life. Oh my God. And, oh, then, the they pressure. Bring in, and then they bring in a model and then you have to draw the model. Um, I, no, this is like this is like my nightmare of like <laughs> any kind of that where you're like it's a test high anxiety, pressure, high pressure, high pressure, high pressure I on the spot creativity. I would have been passed out. <laughs> I would have passed out. I don't think so. I mean, look, we, we're all it's a good prep for like auditioning and callbacks and just we're all, you're always under pressure. We're under pressure right now with doing the podcast. <laughs> but um but yeah, I mean, I think growing up in New York, you're constantly under pressure. So uh, I, I, maybe I was used to it for that reason. But uh, you do, I do you have do to this. say, Tina, Tina, there is something yes, about yes. you that is like super um, badass tough, even just <laughs> the way you present and your voice in the best possible way. So like. And I wonder if that is a mix of, you know, New Yorker, Asian American parents. My my guess is I'm the a daughter of an immigrant. You're a daughter of an immigrant, right? You're of immigrants? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's like a toughness about you. And like, all I can, like, uh, you're a badassery. Do you think it is um, 
New York? What is it? Where does that come from? Because you should play you you should play an assassin and a um like a, a like an action hero in in like huge films. Why is oh. that? We got to make that happen today. Yeah, Anyways, let's just call so, Kevin Feig and just let him know. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm yeah. available. What, okay, so where does that come from? And then we'll get into how you ended up being in a um in a uh in the you got from the fine arts to the the dramatic arts. Okay. Well, I, I think you touched on it. I think it's all those things that make up who I am. I, I, I am tough. I am tough, but I, like I, I, but I don't see myself necessarily that way. Um, I'm like, you know, I think we've, I think I spent actually a lot of years trying to counteract that tough expectation by being like smiley and sweet and doing the things that I think women tend to do, women identifying women do, tend to do like by softening themselves and being smaller in the room. And I think over the years, as you get older, you hit 40 and you're like, fuck that. Oh, am I allowed to curse on this? Okay. <laughs> you're just kind of like, absolutely. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking over this. Um, but I think it's all those things. I think definitely New York and always having your defenses up and always having an awareness um, around you and having parents that worked extremely hard and sacrificed a lot and knowing that I could sacrifice more. I think that's also part of like surviving as an artist. Like, do I need to eat that fancy thing today? Do I need to have that new outfit? Like, no, I, if I want to succeed, then those are the things I need to let go of in order to invest in my career. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it is identifying as an Asian American female. I think having immigrant parents for sure that work really hard. Um, I think New York City and all of its uh, dangers <laughs> that I survived. So I survived theater school and New York City. Um, and now I'm trying to survive L.A. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. right, right. A lot, of, a lot of surviving happening. So at what point did you, well, obviously you told your parents that you applied and that you got in for the fine arts program. Yeah. They obviously had to get on board with that at some point because you're still doing it. But then how, tell us about the switch into acting. So it was my first year as a, as a, you know, a drawing, painting, sculptor. And I just found it really lonesome. Like I, 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 I was like a little emo kid, you know what I mean? Like all this angst. I had just had so much angst because I grew up, I had a rough childhood. And I, I just felt, found myself in a little bit of a depression as a freshman in high school, which is, I guess, not that rare. But um, I just kept looking at the theater department and seeing these kids getting to like fully ex express themselves and be around others like them. You know, painting is a solitary thing. I think like writing. I don't know if you have that experience, the two of you, because I know, read that you're both writers. Um, and I write as well. And it, it's a very different world you're in. So I decided to just do it, apply to the theater department. And that process, first, it's like two monologues, right? Contemporary and a classic. Do you and, remember what you did? Do you remember what you did? Oh, it's okay. Oh, boy. I did. I bet I did it was a, great, whatever it was. The modern piece, I don't remember the name of it or, or where it was from, but it was it was a girl um, witnessing her parents', her parents divorce. And but going through her house and talking about how the home represented the family, um, you know, and, and like where things belonged in the house and how those things are going to be moved. And that means their family no longer existed, exists. So it was a really beautiful piece. I can't remember where it was from. Um, and then the other one was Shakespeare. And I'm sure I did a terrible job. <laughs> uh, it may have been. I don't remember the Shakespeare. Yeah, I don't remember the Shakespeare. That's funny. Yeah, but I bet, oh. you know, he, you go, you know, you know. It was Portia. The quality of mercy is not straight. It, it, oh, uh, yes. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. So we have, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm just picturing both you two. Um, for Gina, I'm wondering, I'm thinking it was to get into DePaul's theater school, right? Okay, and Tina, yours was even younger because you were trans you were like 15, 14, playing yeah. Portia. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Fourteen year old Portia's all around. Okay, so you must have okay, so then what did you did the, what did it go on from there? Like you did your monologues? Oh, so yeah, so then you do that and then there's a callback, so you go to another room with a different auditor. 
and I'm trying to make sure I don't blend my high school audition to my college audition. But um, then we went from that callback to a screen test. So you can do a screen test. And then... Um, wait, wait, a screen test for LaGuardia? Yeah, like, wow. yeah at, at the time, at the time, yeah, it, I, I remember that because I remember they said you have to go to the screen. So there's like a camera and you, whatever, on-camera audition. And then from there, oh, I, I remember there was five steps. Um, I can't remember what the... I remember we may have had to go into the theater and do like a, like theater exercises and movement stuff. And then we had to do a interview, one-on-one -on -one interview with the head of the department. So it was, you know, a lot of steps to. This is to, so far you know. tougher than it was for our, the audition. Like we had to do those other things you're describing, but we did not. I don't think we did a one-on-one -on -one interview. That's no. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as a kid, I I guess I didn't really like. It didn't maybe didn't sink in that I was that that's what was happening, but I just, you know, followed the line. I, whatever they told me where I needed to go, I just went and did it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it was a lot more steps than my college audition as well. As well. So, so you got in, did they just tell you on the spot, Tina? Or were you, how did it work? And then were you, did you tell, did your parents know you were switching? Uh, no, they didn't know. No, they didn't know. <laughs> no, I think I, I think I just got a letter. I don't, I don't know. If, I don't think they, I think they gave me the sense that it was a good fit, but I don't think I knew until later because it's like thousands of kids in New York City, right, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Auditioning. So. so I'm curious about whether the, like what, what the pipeline situation was from LaGuardia to conservatories. Cause a lot of kids who get training young or get working young don't go for theater school because they figure like well I already know what I'm doing so like what what how was it at LaGuardia did mostly kids go and pursue performing arts in college or what you know I think a handful of us did but honestly I, I think a lot of people didn't continue on so it was kind of a weeding out process you know a lot of people went into poly, pol political science so a lot of people went into you know, a lot of different things. I mean, a lot of people I, I remember I went to high school with are doing amazing things currently. I mean, one of one of the girls I was friends with, she's like a pundit on CNN, <laughs> like like one of the leading. She went into politics and then became like a, a on camera. So those two worlds sort of merged. Um, but yeah, no, I I think I ended up applying to four schools, four conservatories. So SUNY Purchase. Rutgers, I don't remember, NYU, and what was the fourth one? I'm going to just throw out Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Carnegie. I, no, 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 it was Boston University. I actually, it was interesting. I didn't, I didn't, I was so, I don't know. I just, I didn't do Juilliard and I didn't do Carnegie Mellon. I don't know why. Um, oh, I know why. Pittsburgh. <laughs> I didn't want to go to Pittsburgh. Sorry if, if either of you have a fondness for Pittsburgh, but I didn't want to be there. Never um, been. And also, I have a friend that went to the Carnegie Mellon program and started in 1993, and they weighed them at the in their acting classes. They weighed them. So I'm glad we didn't go. I mean, you know, whatever. Yeah. We're missing, not missing out. Forget forget Pittsburgh. Also, the weighing. Fuck you. So, yeah. Okay. So, you, you auditioned. Did you do like the Erda, like with all of them at once, Tina? Or did you go, how did it work for your colleges? And then tell us how, how you made your choice. So, uh, yeah, I think I did do them. You know, they, they set up the appointments to the different places. I remember that. I really wanted to go to SUNY Purchase. I do remember that because Israel Hicks was the head of the department then. And I remember thinking, oh, he's an amazing teacher to study under. Um, and it was such a small conservatory program. Um, so I went up there. That, that By that point, I did tell my parents I was going to theater school. And they were not happy about it. <laughs> I mean, imagine, they're immigrants, right? They came across the world not speaking the language, giving up everything, working very, very hard to make a better life for their children. And then their one child that didn't go to co that is going to college wants to be an artist. I mean, that's like pretty brutal for them to absorb. But um, yeah, I, you were saying when you leave high school, like why, why go into the theater school? I 
because I both my brothers had not gone to college, my older brothers, and my parents were, you know, had immigrated here and like I just I felt like college was really important. I felt like getting an education was really important. And maybe I remember thinking at the time, imagine being 17 and thinking I'm ruining my career because I thought it was going to slow down my career. Um, because I did have when we have an industry night at the end of high school and I got a manager, a New York City manager, and I was freelancing with all these different agents. And for like the few months that I was not going to leave New York and, um, they, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to go back here because I'm in awe. Gina, are you in awe? Because I'm in awe that you yes. you had an industry night at, in high school mm-hmm. and you got a manager from that. Mm-hmm. You're how old? 17? 17, yeah. Okay. 17. You have a manager and you're freelancing. What did that feel like? I mean, I'm like that. I'm like in awe. Were you like, I am the shit? Or are you like, this is just what I do? You're like a young, like a 17-year-old professional actor. What the <laughs> hell? I think I think I was kind of like feeling like my dreams were coming true in a lot of ways, but I don't think I was secure in it. I definitely for sure was like, this could go away tomorrow. Um, am I doing the right things? You know, I, that manager at the time, she was lovely, but it, she did say to me, like, you should move to Los Angeles. And at that point, I just wanted to go to college. And, it, and most of the options were on the East Coast that I wanted to, to, you know, except for Boston University. Well, Boston's East Coast, too. But um she just said, like, well, I just feel like if you move to the West, to L.A., like, later, you're going to be over the hill. I was 17. Oh I was 17. Oh and so that freaked me out. I mean, it's really like such out. projection. It's such projection. It's all, sure. I mean, sure. they mean, even if they mean well, it's still projection. So you had this manager, but you were, and you were auditioning, I'm assuming, in yeah. New York City. yeah. Yeah, but then, I, but you really wanted to go to college. I really and wanted so, to go to college. Okay, so you wanted to go to SUNY. What happened there? Why? How did you end up at NYU? Oh, so I got in um, to purchase, uh, which was which was a tough choice because SUNY Purchase is like at the time was so cheap for in-state like residents. And then, but I I can't explain this to you at all. But I went when I went and auditioned for NYU. Uh, I fell asleep at the audition, I remember, in the waiting room. I just, like, kind of <laughs> nodded off, and I just think I just needed to be relaxed, you know? So, because there was what all these, like... power move. I love no. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I was just, like, you know, overwhelmed, or... I don't think it was overwhelming, but I just felt like I just needed to relax. And there was, like, you know, a bunch of young act, New York City actors. And at the time, NYU was a top conservatory. And I think I... There was like all these young actors that were like, <laughs> like doing all the warm ups, which I believe in a hundred percent. I do it before shows, but like, but it intimidated me in some way. Cause I was like, well, I didn't start acting until I was much older. I mean, I was young, but you know, in New York, it felt like everybody's a kid actor that was in acting. So I don't know. I, uh, I fell asleep and then they woke me up and said, it's your turn. I was like, Oh, okay. And I went in. And I remember in all my auditions, I did this weird thing, which, which I don't know if it's an, I, I took my shoes off in every audition. Like I, I felt like I needed to be grounded. So oh I my God. In. It's a power move. It's a power move. Listen to me. Anyone, this is how I feel now watching youngsters. I mean, I don't hold auditions, but when, when someone has a specific bold take on, uh, on how they are going to enter a room they they're uh, yards ahead of everybody else. You made a bold move, Tina, huh. and I I support it. I support it. You it's like you you had a take. Good for you. I, I think I just needed to take care of myself, and I I think at the time I didn't really have a lot of um, protection and people taking care of me in that way as a young artist. So I think I just had my own process. Um, but part of that was being weird and saying. I need to take my shoes off and taking off my shoes. I've never told anyone that before. Um, so yeah, I did all my auditions that way. This is so way. related. This is so related to you being tough and, and a badass because I think c- kind of what I'm hearing is however, the, I mean, I don't know necessarily the right way to say this, but you haven't waited for permission. Like you didn't wait for permission from your parents to audition for the school and you didn't you know, ask them, is it okay if I take, you know, you just did a lot, you've done a lot of things and maybe it's because you have felt like you've had to do it 
this vein on your own since you didn't have right. any family members who, who, who had pursued this career. But I want to know, oh, sorry, you were actually, I interrupted you, you were in the middle of finishing your audition story. No, I, I don't, where were we? I don't, <laughs> I don't remember. Took off, sorry. okay, so you, that's okay, that's okay. We, I'm, I'm clocking. So you're there, you, uh, you, you did all your auditions and you said you don't know how to explain it, but when you got into NYU, when you did your NYU I, audition. Well, when I was waiting in the waiting room, when I fell asleep, that's where I was going. I just felt like I belong there. I just felt like I belong there. I was just like, this is where I need to be. Even though Purchase was my first choice and Purchase at the time was very competitive. They took like 10 people in that year and I, and it would have been cheap, really cheap. That's one thing. NYU is not cheap. Um, but I, for sure, I just had this overwhelming sense that this is where I needed to be. And, um, yeah, I, I did the audition for Beth Turner, who was amazing, amazing I think she was a dean at the time, but um, auditor. And then she asked me uh, what studio I wanted to be in. And I told her Playwrights Horizons or I think Adler is what I chose. And she asked me why Playwrights because she thought I should be placed in what was then called Experimental Theater Wing, which is very physical. So I understand it now. She saw in me that I'm a very physical person. Um, and, uh, I told her, <laughs> this is the hilarious part. I told her playwrights was my number one choice because you can study directing, acting, and design, which is what I ended up doing. And I said, I need a fallback plan, <laughs> which is like directing and design, like great fallback plan, Tina. But here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The other thing that I'm seeing is that at, you knew, um, if fallback plan or not, you wanted to study more than one thing. Yes. And most people go in there saying, oh, I just want to be a movie star, so I have to go into Atlantic because yeah. David Mamet will cast me in. Like, you wanted a more broad um, sense of, yeah, you you were like, we have several actors on the show like this where it's, um, they're like more Renaissance people in terms of writing, acting, directing, and they're, and they're true, like for me, what it is is a true artist instead of an actor. It's a, it's more of a collaborator and doing making art in a collaborative setting. And it happens to be for you right now, acting and maybe writing and maybe directing if you have or something. So I, I love that. And also my NYU audition, I went without having picked a, a studio. So they asked me where you want to go. And I said, I have no idea. Well, they didn't let my ass in, nor should they have. <laughs> oh, no, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I think when I say fallback, plan, I don't really think that is what it is. Because I didn't think, obviously, you know, it's all a risk that we're taking. It really is true that I was very... Um, I'm very interested in all aspects of storytelling. And I did tell her that she asked me why directing. And I said, I am, I am incredibly stimulated in a different way w when thinking about directing and how a story can be told and how it's structured and, and all of that. And, and I said, but it's not necessarily my heart. My heart is acting, but my mind is very connected to directing when she asked me that question. Yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier your manager and saying you're going to be over the hill and so forth. So we spent a lot of time talking about, um, you, you said something about being 40, so, you, so you're at least 40, which we are, we're 47. So um, we spent a lot of time in the podcast talking about like the whack messages that we got, especially being, uh, you know, 90s, mid 90s, late 90s about like what you can and can't do right. and who you are and who you aren't and how you come across it. And sometimes those opinions are wildly off base and sometimes they're smack right on. What, what about you? Where did you fall on that with terms of like the, the feedback people was, were giving you? Um, you know, it's, I think I'm still dealing with that today. I mean, I, I, the feedback was people couldn't tell if I was a leading lady or if I was a character actor. And I will say they probably thought I was a character actor just because I was a woman of color. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to be the best it, friend. It, right. It's because they couldn't see beyond their own biases and the biases of the industry. And look, I think some of that is a product of the environment those people are in. But also, sure. nobody challenged 
And that's what I'm ask. I feel like people are at least starting to do now. Challenged why someone couldn't do something. Sure. So yeah. I, so they told you, oh, we think you're gonna be like, you know, Sandra Bullock's best friend or like, um, whatever. What the sidekick? Because probably because you you're an Asian American woman, you yeah. know. Yeah. Or you're um, the nerd, or you know, put on some glasses, and now you're like network nerdy. Um, you know. So it's it's it's. How did, did you ask me how did I deal with it? Is that the question? No, I'm just curious. <laughs> like, people usually have an anecdote or two about, like, you know, I just told it on the podcast last week that, you know, I went to this thing when I was in high school, like, how to get in the business. And the only thing I re- remember the guy saying is, thin is in, and you're either going to get thin or you're not going to be in hot. Like, it was just very binary. And by the way, that was true. Like he wasn't he wasn't saying anything yeah. that wasn't true, but it doesn't matter because I internalized that message and then I never wanted to be in film. And then I was like, I'll, okay, that means I can never be in film and TV. And I yeah. never even thought twice about it until like two weeks ago when I remembered that's, that, 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 that. That's so heartbreaking. That's so heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, my parents even honestly said, you can't be an actor. You're, you're Asian, you know? There's nobody like you there's no there's not many women like you you're not going to be successful you're going to be hungry all the time you're never going to you know and you know they weren't totally wrong they weren't trying to hurt me they you know they i think they were trying to protect me but ultimately it hurt me do you know what i mean it hurt my confidence it hurt you know so a lot of my defense mechanism is to have confidence if that makes any sense Um, Well, that's that's what I'm getting is that in response to the binary, you were able to go, well, no, I'm going to actually take care of my own self and take my own shoes off if I want to. Actually, I'm still going to move forward and be like, I just love the idea of a woman of color being on a soap opera as one of the like a recurring main characters, because soap operas to me in terms of casting have not in the past been known to really embrace all kinds of things. But here you are on like Americana, which is soaps to me. And I mean, you have telenovelas and whatever, but but American soap operas are a thing and you're on one. So. I know the word trailblazer is so overused, but I feel like you're a trailblazer and what people fail to remember about trailblazers is, is that it's dirty, sweaty, hard work because you're literally in the dirt forging a path for yourself and perhaps those that come after you. Do you feel like that when you're working that you're, and it's not fair to put it on people like women of color or women or othered people, but do you feel like in some way you're blazing a trail for other folks or do you just are just like, no, I just, I want to work. No, I, I appreciate that question. I, I feel hopeful that that's what's happening. Do I think about it consciously when I'm working? Not necessarily, but I do intend to, if I can, give other people opportunities. Like, if I don't suit a role, if they're like, well, this person's Vietnamese, will you audition? I pass. And I usually, you know, I've played other Asian races before because there are limited amount of roles. But I also believe, like, you have to get to a certain level and have a certain level of, uh, of accomplishments in order to open the door for other people. So I will, I have, like I said, I'm passing on this, but this is this actress that you should look at. And I've sent names and, you know, things, little things like that within my power. And I'm not trying to say like I'm a trailblazer or anything like that. I'm just trying to do the work, like you said, and uh, take the opportunities when I can and try to do my best at it. And then hopefully set in some kind of example. I don't know what, but um, yeah, it is a lot. <clears throat> and I, I think that like trailblazing is is um, is done primarily because there is something doesn't exist which we want to see existing and so then we have to do it on our own like I agree that like I never woke up and thought oh one day I'm gonna be like doing all this work um I just thought no like why doesn't this exist why can't plus size or Latinas do this and then I went ahead and tried to make that space but yeah I feel like most trailblazers I know and iconoclasts or whatever don't like have that intention, right? We're not like, oh, I'm going to change. It's more like, no, this shit is wrong. It should exist. And I'm going to participate in change, right? Like a change maker. I'm going to take, I'm going to take space basically and not be apologetic for it. 
And and that's a very hard thing to, to come to. You know, it's like, it's still, I want to apologize all the time. You know what I mean? But <clears throat> that's my instinct. But because I want to be a fair person, but I think ultimately it's like, no, I, I should claim the space and not be apologetic for it. I mean, I had a teacher in theater school, well, and you're saying, what do people put on you? Who said to me, um, Tina, he said something very complimentary about a project I had just finished and something like, you know, good marks or something and said like, you're, you're very talented or uh, whatever. And then he said, what I love about you is that you shatter stereotypes. And on the face of it, you would think that's a positive thing, but I think it put a heavy weight on me. I think I felt this sort of, that's not what I'm, you're, you're putting, that means you're putting so much on me when you even look at me. There's a, there's an expectation of you have to be excellent all the time. You have to be so good all the time. And if you're not, if you're not excellent, people are going to go, oh, Asian women can't act or Asian women shouldn't be doing this. And so there was a pressure, like I felt, wow, like I guess he was trying to say something nice, but ultimately it just put this sort of. No, you know, it puts it, it more tells, work. It tells, it's more work. More work. And, and it also puts like, you see me as a certain lens. You can't just see my work. You're seeing something yeah. else. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And if you could go back in time, if you could go back in time, you'd say to him, oh, well, you're not shattering any stereotypes. Right, right, You're acting exactly like every fucking asshole theater teacher who's told women things like that before. Yeah, but it's it's an awkward thing to approach because you know they're not trying to be rude. Or, or not trying to be demeaning, but no, it's a systems it's a problem. Yeah. It's a systems problem. So, so now what I, I've, and maybe you do this too, and maybe Gina, you do it. Like now, I say like, oh, like let's ask the question. I wonder why that stereotype exists in the first place, and who is that benefiting? And let's like start there. Like let's go a little bit under the compliment sandwich and see like, oh, but like, wouldn't it be awesome? And no one's going to say this at the, I don't know, maybe kids now do say like, hey, wouldn't it be awesome teacher, boss, mother, father, if we could get to the bottom of why that shit started in the first place and who benefits from it? Because then we could really, instead of like, but for me, if someone gives me a compliment and I'm 17, I go, oh yeah, I'm breaking stereotypes all the time. Of it, and that's great. And then you realize it's a heavy burden. It's a heavy burden yeah. to, yeah, yeah. It also tells you that they're still looking at, that that, that person is still looking you, at you through the white gaze, the, the framing your success on the white gaze, right? Or, or the male gaze or, you know, whatever it would be, you know, the patriarchy. It's kind of like this idea. It reminds you of the framework that's there that you're limited to working in and you will only be seen through that lens. And that's a, that's a, a different, that's a, that's, that reminds you of the, the trap you're in, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, because if, you, if your only framework is white American theater, that's how you're going to frame it. You shatter stereotypes instead of you're a part of American theater. You, you are the future of American theater. Right, which is a different a different way of seeing it. So anyway, there was that. And then the other time you're asking what they did, what happened to another anecdote was when my mother was I was my mom's caregiver when she was sort of in her final days, she passed, and uh, my manager called me. This is not theater school, but at the time a manager called me and he said, you know, we we're talking about schedule and then he said, uh, Hey, can I ask you a question? I said, Sure, thinking he was gonna ask me. How are you doing? Your mother just passed away. He knew for years I was caring for her. And I said, uh, and I said, sure, go ahead. And he says, did you get fat since your mom died? And I had, I had, I had gained weight. Um, but because I, while I was taking care of my mom, I was like, you know, she was dying. So I had gotten on anti-anxiety pills at the time, right? So I gained weight. And I was so shocked he said that. And I said, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I actually have put on weight. And I said, but I'm not going to apologize for that because my mom died. And like, that's that I, I, I'm not going to beat myself up while I'm grieving as well about that. Fuck and then, you. and then he, you. I know. And then he backpedals and he goes, <clears throat> well, I'm going to get in trouble for saying all this. That he backpedaled and he said, uh, you know, because heroin skinny isn't hot either. So he tried to say like being fat isn't good and being or overweight isn't good and being skinny 
is it good? So I said to him, so when am I going to hit the perfect note for you? When is it going to be perfect? Are you going to, I'm just not going to, I said, I'm not going to guilt myself over this because the next you're going to know you're going to, someone's going to tell you that my nose is too big and then I'm going to get a nose job. And then, and then I said, and then I'm going to get my cheek jaw done. I'm going to get all this stuff done that I'm insecure about. Like, when does it end? I said, when I go in the room, I deliver myself and that's what I'm going to deliver the best and with the most confidence. And if you start to make me feel bad about everything, other little thing that's wrong with me, I'm just going to be like every other broken person here. Do you know what I mean? Like, God how can bless. you? Yeah. God bless you for yeah, we don't, like, Not everybody the, would have all the wherewithal to say that as, as, at a young age, especially. He just hit, he just hit a button. You know, I was also like, I had had a, when my mom died, I was like, new policy, no more yeah. assholes. No yeah, well, the other thing, the other thing is like I wonder, and I don't know this person. They could be a perfectly lovely person, but I wonder if he would have said that to a white man client. Like, would it even be a thing? Would it even be, you know, like, you know, did someone say to Russell Crowe? Did his manager say that when he put on weight? No, probably said, "Wow, you you could play anything. You're so diverse. You can play Russell. You could play. It doesn't matter what you Ryan know what Frazier, I mean." But it's a woman, whale. right? Right, yes, right. So, which we haven't talked about on here yet because I haven't seen it, but I'm I'm dying to see that. Yeah. So, so it tells me yeah. that you are uh, when it came time to end and and why you did showcase or whatever, you weren't like putting all your hopes and dreams in something that the school was going to offer you or not offer you. So, tell us about like when you were launching and how you made your how you how you made your moves. Okay, woo, girl. Um, so we didn't do, I don't remember doing an industry night at NYU. And I think I remember feeling like we were not really set off into the world for success. I mean, the most valuable thing I gained from theater school is all the amazing artists that I met there and all the amazing people that I still work. I have a theater company in Los Angeles called Ammunition Theater Company. I'm one of the founding members. We just did a world premiere of Carla Chang's new play, Revenge Porn. Um, it, it's uh, the people that I've met there, those artists are, that's what I walked away from college with and people that makers that I'll always run into and work with for the rest of my life. The school itself, amazing training, very hard, very, very hard. Um, we were scheduled up to the hill. We had to schedule in pee breaks and stuff. I was, I was in a program that everyone lovingly dubbed the suicide track, which is a terrible thing to call anything in college, but that's what we called it. Um, because it was acting, directing, and design, and um, but we didn't get we didn't get set up like we couldn't we weren't even allowed to really mingle with the film department, which would make sense if there was a marriage between the acting schools and the film departments because NYU had one of the finest film departments, uh, film schools in the country, if not the world. So it was one of those things that. I felt was odd because they wanted to protect like the conservatory program and like, you know, we're real actors we're not doing film or, you know what I mean? There was like a weird, you can only audition for things outside of school after your sophomore year. Uh, you could only, you know, there were rules that I, I understand, but to some degree, but in terms of setting up your graduates for a working life, that was not the concern for the school. It's as if so. they design conservatories to be so great and insular and amazingly exclusive. And then um, once you graduate, your life stops and that's it. And there is no, like, you will just be stuck at 19, 20 forever. And they never, like, imagine you'd have to actually get a job outside of the, uh, a conservatory. It's like, I wish, uh, yeah. Know? I wish there was like a business of acting. I wish there was a how to do your taxes as an actor. I, I wish there was learning about a, a pass through, an escort. I wish there was like, you know, just the nuts and bolts of how to be an adult as an actor going forward. Um, you know, we had a we had a theater for nonprofit which class, which I was like, great. That's I do that now, but I'm also like, I think I could have figured that out at some point. Um, you know? So you grad you graduated and you were kind of like how did it go Tina were you like I'm I, where did you stay in New York you when did you come to LA I mean I'm mindful of time but here's what I want to know how you launched yourself and because I just b probably believe it was stunning right the way you launched yourself well I 
graduated and then I moved to the Bay Area, which was like a very strange little blip. And so I went there and I'm not, I'm not, I don't regret it, but I was uh, with my partner who I ended up, we ended up getting engaged and, and he was going to Stanford grad school. So that was a rough period, but I did a lot of theater and I feel like I did learn a lot about myself as an artist there and how to be independent on that, in that way and, you know, creating high art, you know? Um, but I got a movie. I, I, I ended up getting an agent in San Francisco and um, got a movie, which ended up taking me down to Los Angeles. I joined the union. I was the lead of this film. It went to a bunch of festivals and in LA, what I ended up doing was... What's it called? What's it called? Just so we can look it up. It's silly. It's called Pig Hunt. Great. Not I don't care that it's silly. I'll take it. I'll watch it. Um, uh, yeah, it's just like a, a fun monster movie. Um, so yeah, I did that. And then the, just the work wasn't enough in San Francisco to, to keep it afloat. So I thought now's the time to start going to Los Angeles. And I started dipping my toe in Los Angeles. And how I did that was back then they had casting director workshops. You guys know those, right? Um, but I was interning, so I would be working and at those things and getting those for free and meeting casting directors and somehow getting appointments. And then I started a fake, uh, a fake management company. Oh my gosh. Should I be saying this? Um, with like, yes, you should. Cause you can always edit it yes. out if you change your mind. Um, and yeah. also a lot of, a lot of badass people have done this FYI. Yeah. So I started a fake management company called Fisher management. I made a logo and I was interning at a casting office as well, a couple of casting offices. So I saw how the submissions were coming in and I saw we would D pile, C pile, B, you know, piles for agencies and passes. And um, I remember I'd, re I'd be a reader for the casting office. And so they gave me a couple auditions, took a bunch of acting classes. My first agent in LA came from an acting class. The teacher said, you should have an agent and this is who you should meet with. Um, and the fake management company, I started just submitting to things like, you know, submitting through someone else had the breakdowns because you used to be able to get the breakdowns too. And I would format it correctly like I learned at the, at the casting office. And then I just show up and get the appointments. I changed my voicemail. I didn't have my own voice. I, you know, you've reached Fisher Management to reach any of our clients. Please leave a message after the beep or whatever it is. And, um, yep, yeah, that's what that's what I did. And I got my first few jobs that way. So we need to write, the three of us need to write a pilot that's like, not quite a take on Breaking Bad, but it's fault. It's mirroring this idea of like, how you just have to grab it for yourself. And we could be having our fake, um, you know, management company and swindling people, <laughs> we're evil. And we turn like, you know, threatening people if we don't get we jobs. We smoke a little mess. <laughs> I was in the Bay Area too after oh. college, like so from yeah, I lived in Oakland from uh, like ninety seven to two thousand and two. Um, so I, I'm just curious what theater companies you worked with and what kind of stuff you did there. Um, Intersection for the Arts uh, and Campo Santo. So I worked with them for a couple of shows, uh, which was really great. And uh, Word for Word Theater Company as well. We did a. Amy Tan show that ended up going, yeah, you know, word for word. So yes. Sue and Joanne and all of them, they're so wonderful. And we, we did a, we did an Amy Tan show that ended up like kept getting revived for like five years. We went to France with the show. We toured California. We, yeah. So, cool. so those two companies. Yeah. So, um, since we only have a few minutes, I want to ask, how I hope my story is making sense. sense. I'm sorry if I've jumped all over. Oh, no, 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 no. Perfect sense. Perfect. Yeah, perfect okay. sense. So um, do you feel like where you're at now in your career that you're, nobody's ever scratching all of the itches, but that like you're scratching the amount of itches that you want to scratch and like, what do you want to do next and where do you see yourself going? Such a good question. Um, well, there's a lot of things going on. I mean, during the pandemic, I also, you know, it was like, how are we going to work when everything was frozen? And we, I just got rid of so much of my clothing and turned my closet into a, you know, a recording studio and started, got a voiceover agent and started doing voiceovers, which was really 
really has been really fun for me. Um, I also have a production company called One to One Productions with my business partner, Carla Mosley, who's also a soap actress. Um, but she also went to NYU. She's incredibly talented. Um, but we've been producing films and short films of, of women of color and women, people we believe in, writers we believe in. And uh, we, we currently have a pilot that we produced by Carolyn Radaray. And that is in Urban World Film Festival uh, in New York uh, next week. It was at Seattle Queer Film Festival. It was just at Outfest in L.A. So it's been doing well. Um, am I scratching the itches? I mean, I'm doing a lot. <laughs> I would say um, I just did this play, Revenge Porn, um, or The Story of a Body by Carla Ching. And I got to be, I feel like it's, I was the lead of, I was the lead of the title, the lead of the show. I mean, it was an ensemble piece, but because everybody was so incredible. Um, it was the first time I felt like seen fully as an artist. And, you know, I was like... I, it, it ended like a week ago. It closed, and I, my heart was so oh, congratulate. broken. Congratulate! Yes, but but you did it. I mean, I just love yeah. hearing that you were seen fully as an yeah. as an artist. Yeah. That is like, ah, uh, fucking amazing. Yeah, I'll tell you what. It was you know, we spend so much of our time feeling dissatisfied in the work that we're in, right, and what we're doing every day, and it was just so good to feel like, like it's gonna make me cry thinking about like. I, I just got to do it. You know what I mean? Like I got to be like the fe a female Breaking Bad type character. You know, like we don't have any of that. I was a flawed pe person. I was vulnerable. I was tough. You know, she, she Kat was. I mean, Kat, the character. She's ferocious. She protects the ones she loves. Um, it was. I really and and I want. I was really proud of it. Like doing, getting to be all of those things on on, on a stage. Um, and to have a, a storyline centered around me and my my cultural identity wasn't the central, wasn't like my trauma and right. all of that wasn't the central piece of the story, but it was a part of the story. You know, it was, it, it was informed my entire character. So, yeah, man. I I'm to that. Theater, theater really scratches that itch for me. Yes, you know, it when does. It's, when it's good and when you're yes. really feeling in yourself and you're really vibing with the audience, like there is, it's like a, I wish I could mainline that feeling. And, the, and, and, I got the to work, and I got to work with these actors, these act, these other actors like uh, Jeannie Sakata and Nelson Lee and Christopher Larkin and the playwrights amazing, Kayan Kim who went to Juilliard. Um, you know, these are these are all these amazing actors that we all never get to play these things. And well, right. And I, you, my, I was just gonna say that representation matters. And people stop there, but for me, it's the kind of sto that stories representation uh, stories matter you know not just putting bodies on a stage that are a certain look or a certain yeah. ethnicity but what is the actual motherfucking story that we're representing yeah. on stage yeah. or on screen so and, go ahead i'm gonna cut you off no, about no, the okay. playwright no it's okay it's just you know carla tells these asian american stories and we don't have a lot of asian american stories it's like you need to know Kung Fu or you need to speak three languages or you need to be able to do all of these things. Like what if you're just someone who grew up here and doesn't see themselves ever anywhere and have to like project yourself onto these other characters you see that are just living their lives in America and grappling with how they fit into that puzzle, that puzzle without it being about, do you know what I mean? Just I'm American. Um, I, I, absolutely. And I love, and, and you know? by the way, what if, what if every white actress had to learn a martial art in order to do their, to do a part? Like, I mean, well, we'd have a lot fewer actresses, which but might those, be listen, those stories, way. the stories are all valid. I, I, I think all of those in immigration stories, all of that is a hundred percent important and part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Right. And, no. and, we cannot, and we cannot be told what stories we're allowed to, to be told. Like, that story isn't Asian enough. It's like, what? Right. No, it is because I'm telling you. I, I, yes, um, yes, exactly. We are, I think it comes down to like, for me too, like as a Latina, but born in this country, doesn't speak, I'm not fluent. Like it's, we're told, all of us are told we're not enough or too much. And what right. I'm hearing from you is, and what I think is coming next is, no, 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 this is enough. We are enough, and there is enough story within what already exists to be true that we can mine so that we don't have to come up with 700 million more stories about, you know, Latinas that are maids. Like, yep. let's not do that. Let's, right. like, 
mind what we've got right in front of us before That's it right. disappears, you dumb That's fuckers. Right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I was going to say, Jeannie, Jeannie Sakata, who's the, the more mature, one of the, she played my mom in the play. She's, she's like kind of a stage legend. She's like East West players, you know, she, she said um, to me and to Carla, you know, I think I've waited my entire career for some of the scenes that I get to do in this play. Like just to have a scene that where she's a full complex person, you know? And like, I mean, it just, I haven't waited as long as her, but I'm grateful for people like her who is a true trailblazer. Do you know what I mean? So I think like, Amen. you know, I gotta give, I give it, gotta give my, my sister props on that. Cause I love that. And we'll, you know? we'll put her name in the show notes and link to whatever she's on the internet so that everybody yes. can check her out. Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna let you go because I told you it'd only be an hour. So thank you so so. Thank much. you. You are amazing. You are. You are. Thank you for the podcast. Thank you. How did you find me? I don't even know how you found me. Gina. Gina does her research. <laughs> um, I just watch things, and when I like actors, I write down their name, and then I look up if they went to theater school, and then I find their representation. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, so. We were Thank you for reaching you. out. Thank you. you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Keep right. in touch. Take care. Bye. Okay.